It's already a policy. It's a policy existing in a different area. So you want to consolidate it into... Exactly. I don't see the need for two separate policies. I I'm actually going to... I'm going to disagree, Kevin, because I think that... Okay. Um, thank you. I, I think that we still need to encourage all students to come forward with their thoughts and opinions outside of the student representatives. <coughs> and I'm fine with that. I'm just looking to get rid of policies. I know, but I think we should probably keep them separate. Okay. Um, the next policy for first reading is policy ECB, which is integrated pest management. The policy that you see presented to you um, is Pauline um, reviewed and all and Pauline and Ernie and is um, based on Drummond and Woodsum guidelines. Any questions or comments on that? We have to have this right. This we is have to have that. <laughs> um, next one, policy E. Oh, there were guidelines along with that also. Policy ECE, which is traffic and parking control. The policy committee is recommending that this policy be deleted for really two reasons. One, um, there is sort of a push at this point to see if we might streamline this <laughs> so it could become more user friendly. Um, and also that when we talked about it, traffic and parking control fall under the purview of town ordinances and it's really not a school board function. Um, so that's our recommendation. I'm happy if anyone has any comments. I do. Because of that email we received from the citizen relating to parking at the high school, um, I'm wondering if maybe we can change this text to not focus on traffic regulation, et cetera, that is handled by the, the town, but rather to encourage um, a parking plan that's act, that's communicated efficiently to students and parents. Jeff, do you want to maybe address that? Because I think you have a plan. And <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> Jeff up, Jeff down. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I I think I know the email you're talking about, and I think I met with that parent um, last week, and there was some misunderstanding. I guess I would say, and, and he did point out one, since the renovation of the building, um, the par we did update the contract that relates to students being allowed to park on campus, but it still reflects in some ways some pre-renovation things, so he did point out some ways in which we could, and I agree with him, and I told him that we will do that. Um, I've also explained to him the process that we use to educate the kids about where kids could park, and he, I think he was satisfied with that as it came to juniors and seniors. His, his daughter is a junior. Um, I agreed with him that we probably, it would be good for us to develop a map, uh, particularly for the sophomores with whom we don't meet at the beginning of the year about parking because almost none of them have parking driver's licenses. Um, and I think those were mostly his issues. And he was, he was under the impression and I'm not sure if this goes to the, sub the focus of your question, but he was under the impression that there was a shortage of parking spaces at the high school, that there weren't parking spaces, and I assured him that there are, since the renovation, plenty of parking spaces at the high school. So it was a matter of education, yeah. and I think helped him to understand what kids can and cannot do, what we communicate to the be at the beginning of the year, and it was a good reminder for me about, okay, maybe we need to step back and we can do some things to improve the communication, and we will do that. My recollection with my uh, discussion with Troy the other day is the other piece is that every student has to have a permit to park on campus. Correct. Which also places where they can park. Correct. Where they can't park around as far as community services is concerned. Right. <clears throat> well, Trish, I still would like to recommend that we keep this just because I think it's just good to have it in our, just in case Jeff? we can say yep. we have something that refers to it. Now, isn't this in the student handbook itself? as far as parking privileges yes and just yes. the basics that you have to go to the office right you have to your go to the office you have to yes so i mean they give them the basic yeah that's fine i just still think since obviously there is a place for it in policies has been given um you know ece that 
but I strongly feel where it really isn't the purview of the school board. You know, it is. Yeah, I agree. Falls under the ordinances. But, but parking areas do fall within the, the purview of the school board. So. Uh, Jeff, question. Maybe that'll be able to return you to your seat. This one? <laughs> My best recollection is this has always been a matter of building policy, mm -hmm. that the building, whoever the principal and vice principal were, developed the parking plan for the high school? Question mark? That's the way we've done it. I mean, we have talked with the police when we need to talk with the police in terms of enforcement and things like that and, and, and cooperating with them around that. But that's been the practice anyway, Kevin. Okay. That's what I thought. That's my best recollection. The other question, just out of curiosity, who was it issuing tickets to the student? Uh, police? Oh, oh. Community, uh, that's actually community services staff issuing school provided parking things um, and the reason for that is the major problems that we have with students parking is students leaking into community services spaces either in front of the building or behind the building where the pool is um, and so we've worked together with the community services folks um, um, so that they because it's their major interest <laughs> To do it, they've been gracious enough to spend the time so that Troy and I don't have to do that. Um, it's not a big time expenditure, I don't think, by the community services staff either. But when there are issues repeatedly, we will talk to the kids, and sometimes all we can do to get the message across is to. Uh, is, is, yes, is, 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 the question is I have is what's the authority for doing that? I don't believe there's any legal authority for that across the state of Maine. And the second question is, wouldn't it be just as easy, since parking comes under the purview of the police department, to call the police and have them issue a legal agent issue a ticket? Uh, if <laughs> my understanding is that the police will come over and they will issue tickets, for example, if a student parks in a handicapped space um, or is illegally parked in a space which is not signed, but I don't think they've been happy about the possibility of ticketing students because they're parking in community center space. I think their attitude is that's sort of the school and the community services responsibility to take care of that. And that's bizarre. I, I'm not. I, I'm not, I, no, I'm not <coughs> arguing with you. So, but it, it, if the parking falls under the purview of town ordinance, I don't understand where we get the authority to issue tickets. And I think we've just, it, there's a big can of worms there. And, you know, frankly, I don't care if the police don't like to give tickets. That's their job. Uh, why, don't I, why don't we take this back to the policy committee? If anyone has any comments or questions sure. um, related to this policy, they can email them. Is there anything you want to add to that, Sue? I don't, I don't know. But. Just to clarify the ticket. It's a school ticket. It's not a legal police document. It's not a parking ticket. Well, I understand that. It's uh, so. What 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 is the what is the repercussion of getting a school ticket? Students students need to pay a fine. The money from the fine is used to pay for the kind of parking signs that the parent um, <laughs> um, and and to sort of keep up with with the maintenance of the parking spaces and that sort of stuff, but primarily signage. Um, I think it's $15 for four years worth of parking. I believe that's what it is, is, is what the cost of getting a, a permit is. Um, so that's, that's what it is. I mean, we have talked to the police about it. It didn't seem like it was a problem for us to be able to do it. Have I spent, done any legal research to find out? I can tell you it's fairly common practice among schools to do, to do these kinds of things because the notion is that parking is a privilege, it's not a right. But again, I haven't done the research and perhaps we need to do that. Well, my, and again, my primary concern is that our current policy says uh, speed limits, traffic flow, parking restrictions, and vehicle travel restrictions will be in accordance with, will be according to the Town of Cape Elizabeth Travel Regulation Ordinance, and it goes on to cite the balance of that law. It doesn't say that the schools can do it. And if it doesn't say that the schools can do it, I'm concerned that we put ourselves in jeopardy. Madam Chair, I don't believe we are putting ourselves in jeopardy. The school staff has the same authority to issue suspensions. 
uh, expulsions, any other disciplinary action, they're using the same authority to issue a school parking ticket that carries a five ten dollar fine with it. It's well within their job <clears throat> to discipline a student for violation of school rules. Anybody else want to say anything? I, I'm, I'll just add that I will I will um, support the deletion of that policy. I don't believe it belongs with the school board. I believe it belongs with the building administration. So we'll chat about it again. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jeff and Sue. You're welcome. You can sit down, Jeff, <laughs> for a couple minutes. Um, the next policy is policy ED, which is material resources management. We're also recommending deletion of this, and in part, sort of part B of this is um, the following policy, EDB, which you do not have yet, is maintenance and control of materials. It includes a lot of the same information. There seem to be redundancies with the policies in the D section. Uh, there seem to be policies in the E section that are redundant with policies in the D section which deal with inventory. Inventory materials, when we chatted about it, seem to be the same. So we would like to, rec to recommend deletion of this policy, a relook at EDB, which is the next policy for consolidation with other inventory materials policies. Any questions or comments on that? When we vote on this, can you supply us with the one that you think that there are redundancies with? Um, yes. If it, you can, between now and then, you can. It's the following policy, which is EDB. I'm hoping we'll have that for first recommend, EDB. first reading the next time around. That was but, one that was going to be reviewed. But, but. So my question, I guess, is will there be changes to EDB to incorporate whatever might be in ED that's not in EDB? Yeah. So we, can we have, yeah, so you're going to have that first next time. Yeah. Okay. And the last one. Um, is policy IKFC, which is awarding of high school credit, course credit prior to grade nine. Um, the policy um, we're recommending or re recommending this with the ad addition or the edit that explains or defines who a high school student is. It deals with awarding of high school credit prior to grade nine. Any comments or questions on that one? I think that was. That one had been reviewed. Uh, that was sort of Drummond and Woods, and we had no other comments other than to define who a high school student was. I do have a question, and hopefully I'm understanding this correctly, that if a child is sort of on an accelerated path and they're working toward going to college at you know, the age of 16 or whatever, and they're not technically in ninth grade, but taking courses in seventh or eighth grade, why would you? I don't think you're coming through on the microphone, so they can hear. Okay. Yes, my, my question is when, you, when you're defining a student, are you saying, that they're not saying they have to be a particular age, but for them to receive any credit toward their GPA or their grade point average, they have to technically be a ninth grader. I'm just wondering for those who are on an accelerated path, if well, they're taking these courses in seventh and eighth grade with the intention of going to college sooner, would this prohibit them from? It seems unfortunate to me that it wouldn't be included in their GPA. Which one would you like to have yeah. address it this time? <laughs> Steve, maybe? Steve, here. go ahead. <clears throat> Part of the discussion that we were uh, having at the policy committee is that uh, there does come into play an issue of certification for teachers. If a student, let's say a student is taking an accelerated placement mathematics, so geometry for instance, in, in the eighth grade and we're considering should that student receive high school credit for it. If a teacher has uh, K to 8 certification and is certified to teach mathematics and is teaching that geometry class, you could also have another scenario where a teacher is 7 through 12 certified in just math. If you're 7 through 12 certified, in a middle school, you can, uh, students could receive, uh, receive credit for a math class taught by somebody with that certification. But you can't from someone who has K-8 certification, general mathematics. So that really presents quite an issue at the middle school as far as staffing is concerned. I understand this would be an exceptional situation if a child were doing that, but perhaps you could accommodate that child if need be by either they would move over to the high school to take that math class or whatever so that they could 
try to accomplish that goal if that was a goal that the staff was on board was appropriate for that student? You mean as far, uh, we have had um, last, we don't have any students this year who are taking classes at the high school. We did have a student last year who went down and so it's an occasional piece, but those students still haven't received any credit for the class because they're still expected after the eighth grade to take four years of mathematics in the high school. If they receive credit as an eighth grader for the math, they wouldn't have to, they would not technically be required to complete any math beyond their junior year. And if, if I can, if, if so just to clarify it a little bit as well, um, at least as, as, as of a couple years ago, and I think it's still true today, I think the current state regulations don't allow a high school to give credit for um, work that's taken in middle school classes. We do have middle school students occasionally who will come up. It's typically math. Um, and what we do is ref we reflect on the high school transcript that the student took that particular class, but they don't get credit for it. Um, they get the benefit of it, and I think one of your questions, what you're getting at, is would this in any way inhibit the ability of a student um, who is particularly accelerated to graduate early? And the answer is, I think it doesn't have any practical impact on that particular issue because we, we will work with students. That's typically a, a student who wants to explore graduating at the end of the junior year. The vast majority of our students by the end of the junior year, um, if they've notified us early, in, early enough in advance, we can, we can figure out a way to work with the family and them to get them credit. Um, the issue that really prompted this particular change in the policy really didn't have to do with getting credit for work that was done in, this, in the middle school, but whether or not after, during, during, for credit for work that happened during the summertime okay. in enrichment type of programs, which is a proposal that really prompted this, this issue to be looked at um, seriously. And, and the concern was that the reality, is it's, it's something that's left ambiguous in state regulation, and the reality is that our kids do an awful lot of enrichment programs, and what this really reflects is just we'd prefer not to get into the business of judging which ones are good and which ones are bad and which ones are worthy and not worthy of high school credit, particularly since most of our kids don't have a difficulty meeting the credit requirements at the high school. That answers my questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> Any other comments or questions um, that the policy committee should address? Thank you, Steve and Jeff. And I think that's it. Uh, 11C, consideration of superintendent's nomination to administrative positions for 2007 and 8. Okay. I'd like to preface this uh, with the fact that when I was not here the last time, you accepted the nominations of all of the administrators who have been here two years or more. And I think it's important for me to say that you have found in the last six weeks been a very different picture in Cape Elizabeth without a superintendent here. And many different things could happen. And I hope that each of you has had the opportunity to see the strengths of each one of the administrators. And I personally want to thank them all for the hard work they have done while I've been away, as well as you as a board. Because it is very important as a, as a superintendent, as you would see as a board member, to be able, when an emergency like this occurs, that you can step away and know that things are going to run smoothly and people are thinking clearly about their school system and the students and what needs to happen. And so I just, I, I didn't get a chance to nominate them the last time because I wasn't here, but I want to thank you because they are all do a tremendous job. And I cannot tell you how proud I am to be the superintendent working with these administrators and the work they do. With that in mind, I have three administrators who are, are not yet uh, at the two-year position. Steve will go to the two-year position next year. Steve Conley came here last year. Steve and I spent a great deal of time together. Uh, Steve has done a tremendous job at the middle school. Uh, with any school when you come in as a new administrator, there are always changes that need to happen. There are always things that need to happen. And Steve has done that and done that well. And I, I evaluated him twice last year. I have paid very close attention to what he's doing this year and I strongly recommend him as a, what will be now a third year administrator in the Cape Elizabeth school system. The second person is Troy Henninger. Troy came in new this year as an assistant principal. What I have learned from Troy is he's honest, he's fair, and he's upright. And when no needs to be said, he says that and he can do it comfortably. And when yes needs to be said, he can also do the same thing. I think Troy has been a tremendous addition to the high school. He and Jeff have worked very closely together, 
and I highly recommend Troy as going into his second year of probation as an administrator here in Cape Elizabeth. The third person is Dominic DePatsy. Dominic has come in uh, during a period of time where special ed directors are very difficult to find. And so when Dominic DePatsy's name came before me, I cheered a million cheers because I had known Dominic not well, but I knew Dominic when he was in the Mid-Coast region and I knew the work he had done. I cannot say enough about the work he has done in the last six to eight months as, as now the Director of Instructional Support in order to make the changes necessary for us to both meet the letter of the law, including in the area of RTI, which is fairly new to us, and are moving ahead. So I would, I would say to you very strongly that I highly recommend all three of these persons. They are doing the job you need to have done in Cape Elizabeth and doing their job very, very well. So I nominate all three of these four positions uh, for, the next, for the coming year. Do I have a motion, Move Kevin? to accept um, the superintendent's recommendations with great pleasure. Is there a second? Linda? Did further discussion? All in favor? Seven zero. Next, we move on to consideration of job descriptions from the Personnel Committee. This evening, we have a list of 12 different positions that we will look to be approving. And I'm going to start with the list of the administrative support positions for the Ponco principal, middle school principal, middle school assistant principal, <clears throat> excuse me, middle school guidance department, the high school principal, the high school assistant principal, the high school guidance department registrar, and another administrative support position for the high school guidance department um, for scheduling. We have the administrative support for the health department, secretary and health aide, and administrative support to the athletic administrator. And then we have two other job descriptions in the instructional support division for an instructional strategist and a speech language pathologist. And I'd like to move that we approve the job descriptions and copies that I've provided for you. Is there a second? Second. Peter? Yes. Um, discussion? Questions? Statements? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, your spare time? <laughs> Well, uh, to be very honest, we need to thank our administrators for a lot of this work. They're the ones who provided uh, a lot of the update material on the administrative support positions. So Jeff, um, Steve, everybody, uh, Pauline, Dominic, um, we're all very good at going through these line by line and updating them to uh, make sure that we've covered some of the areas that weren't uh, as precise as they should have been in the past. Um, I'll say my statement. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> then a question. Um, the instructional strategists, the terms of employment were 12 month year with actual salary, yada, yada, um, set by the Board of Education through contract negotiations. I was just curious what negotiating group they're in. We're negotiating with them. What, what group is it? Dominic can probably speak to that. Dominic. They're, they're, they're in the teaching negotiation. They are? Okay. Yes. Yeah. The job title's very much like a teacher, but a little bit different. So the first one's at Pond Cove. So it, it, the job description differs a little bit from what a teacher does, but they do some stuff. I was just curious. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions, comments? All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you very much for all that work. Next is consideration of request for high school teacher Dick Mullen regarding a proposed trip to New York City in May. This is you, right, Alan? Yes, okay. yes it is. You have a copy of an email that came in from Dick. Uh, first of all, I, I personally would like to apologize. There is a form that is going to be used by people when they're going on these trips. Unfortunately, because of my being sidetracked, it's laying on my desk and I have not had a chance to finish it. But it will be finished so that all of this information will be very specifically put in. I see that Jeff had talked with Dick and made sure that Dick had provided all of the information that was necessary, including who are the chaperones, 
uh, what, where they're going to be staying, how they're going to be traveling, insurance, et cetera. And I appreciate Jeff for doing that. But uh, uh, again, I will plan to have a form that is completed so that no matter who the instructor is, you get exactly the same information from them. But I would recommend acceptance of this trip. Just a, just a little funny. We talked about that last week, Alan, and when Mary and Trish and I got together and we sort of scratched our heads, couldn't remember who was working on the form. And so Trish said, well, I'll do some work on it. So I think she's done well, a bunch of work on it. So maybe we'll you could, combine I our, thought that's what you're talking about. We'll combine our was, forms. I think it's on his computer. I emailed it. Okay, so. it probably is. <laughs> I think I have 200 and some odd emails still to read from the... Better that two people do it than no one at exactly. all. Yeah, we'll come up with a better exactly. form. Yeah, right, right, right. We'll just compare. Them. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, do I... Um, let's see, we do have to vote on this. Do I hear a motion to um, approve the trip to New York City with uh, Dick Mullen? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Discussion? Questions? No. All those in favor? Opposed? 7 0. Thank you. Oh, and you have one more. Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, one from Gretchen McNulty came in uh, Sunday, and so I'm bringing it, I sent it to you, I think, today by uh, email. So you'd have a chance to look at it, but I do want to go over it. This is from Gretchen for the Cape Elizabeth High School Speech and Debate Team. Uh, she says in the letter, we are pleased to announce that six Cape Elizabeth High School students have been selected to participate in the main delegation, planning to compete in the Catholic Forensics League National Speech and Debate Tournament this year. And if anyone wants a definition of that, we'll turn to Jeff. Uh, <laughs> The tournament will be held in Houston, Texas, and runs from May 24th to May 27th, and will require four judges, uh, and will involve three to four nights stay at the Galleria Weston in Houston. Three of the students will miss one and one half to two days of school, while the other three are seniors on STP at that point in the year. Uh, again, I just got this, so I have not had a chance to talk with Gretchen, uh, but I'm also concerned that we have a May date coming up. So I thought I would bring it to you tonight with the understanding, going back to that form, that there's some specific information that I need to receive from her. But I do know that flight arrangements have got to be made very soon in order to be sure that she can fly out and with these, this group. And so if I can get a go ahead to plan on attending this trip, then I will get the specifics from her and have those for the next meeting in April. Thank you. Yes, Kevin? Move to authorize the trip. Thank you, Kevin. Is there a second? No, second. Karen, discussion? Yes. yes. Jeff, help me. Don't we normally do this uh, Catholic Foresnick League thing every year? Yeah, he's just going to move. Um, I know. I, um, I know we typically send students to one of the two major national forensic leagues. There's one that's called the National Forensic League, and one is the Catholic Forensic League. And public high schools across the country send it's not it's not religiously affiliated, but um, but we typically send to either or both of yeah, those two leagues. And and why it's one and not the other in any particular year, Kevin? I, I honestly it don't. It doesn't know. make much difference. I, I guess the point. The, the question I wanted to reaff uh, you know, what I wanted to reaffirm for myself is, this is an, just about an annual. Yeah, this is this is one of those typical trips, and it's one of those because you really don't know until the last minute whether you're going to get students to go into the finals. Um, that it tends to be one of those that you get fairly, and they get fairly late notice on. So, so the teachers usually have to scramble to make those things happen. Have we been invited yet? I'm sorry. Have we been invited yet? Yes, these are students who have earned their way. So this, this is a done deal, we don't, have, okay. In, in terms of their earning their way, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, other questions, comments? No? All those in favor? Seven zero, thank you. Moving on to committee reports, the finance committee, Rebecca? Yes, the Finance Committee met February 28th, Superintendent's office. Um, we signed warrants. We reviewed the energy report. 
Pauline informed us of some good news that Cape Elizabeth was approved for a $1,100 grant from Efficiency Maine to help buy two variable speed drives for the middle school boilers, which should help lower the amount of time the boilers need to run. Um, we also reviewed the food service report. We, Pauline reported uh, that the count for lunches, not including a la carte, were down by roughly 8,500, um, which obviously concerned us. Uh, so we've asked her if she could possibly provide a sales by item analysis to see if we can find any possible underlying factors. You know, we were ne our next meeting will be Wednesday, March 28th at 8.30 in the superintendent's office. Go ahead. I just, I, when we t you were talking about energy, I just thought, we haven't heard from Phil Coop. Are we doing, when we talk about energy, yeah. any status or follow-up on energy? Um, well, we met, we, uh, at the time it was Elaine, myself, met with the chair and the finance chair and superintendent and the town manager to discuss a joint um, uh, alternative energy effort. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, we were unsure about what Tabor was going to be doing, and Mike really felt that at this point he wasn't prepared to try to organize something like that. Subsequently, um, Kathy and I did try to, we did meet with um, the chair of the town council, but because, no, sorry, the finance chair of the town council, but because the chair was unavailable at the time, we postponed discussing the alternative energy. But you have reminded me that I should probably follow up on that, and I will do so. You just had some really cool ideas. Yeah, yeah. I apologize for letting you the cracks. Thank you, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Policy Committee. Trish? Um, well, most of the work we did, you've already talked about. <laughs> We've already talked about. The only other thing that um, I guess we did discuss, I'm going to keep going in the e-policies, but which safety we need to sort of review and talk about. Um, the only other thing we concluded with, and we're certainly still in process, is um, a policy on naming rights. And it's sort of a big topic. So we looked at a couple different samples. We discussed various aspects of it, advertising, location of acknowledgments, et cetera, and we're going to put together a draft to sort of discuss at our next meeting. And our next meeting is um, Tuesday, March 20th, in the William Jordan Conference Room. Thank you. Communications? Um, we have not met, but we have been very busy working on the view with the assistance of many people throughout the district, so thank you. But we have not met since the last meeting. Great. Uh, personnel, Linda. Uh, the Personnel Committee met on February 22nd at 8 o'clock in the Jordan Conference Room. Um, we spent most of our time going through administrative support job descriptions, as well as the couple that Dominic had presented for us. Um, there were some just minor changes that we had made that were noted in the minutes to the meeting. Um, we will continue to work on some other, uh, wrapping up some of the other job descriptions in the administrative support area. And as well, we did have an executive session earlier this evening to discuss a personnel matter. And then our, our next meeting coming up, um, we are adding to that uh, review and um, to look over the ad administrator guidelines for the hiring of coaches. And our next committee meeting is scheduled for Thursday, this Thursday, March 15th at 8 o'clock in the Jordan Conference Room. Thank you. Strategic Planning Committee, Trish. Um, we met on February 16th, and we uh, met with Heidi McGinley, who was a facilitator of the process, and she presented us reams of data that were summarized from the various meetings. We sort of looked at that. Um, interestingly, we identified which areas sort of rose to the surface and which ones had consensus. Um, these included individualized learning plans and approaches for students, a flexible extended school calendar, um, attracting and retaining excellent teachers and staff, and providing a safe and comfortable and ethical environment for our students and teachers. Some of the raw data she presented did indicate that there was some concerns about the vision statement. 
um, and that perhaps we needed to talk about that. She, Heidi presented us with a model for translating the, goal, the data into goals and action plans, and we, um, her model was a little bit different than the future direction plans, which had identified six goals, so we were sort of talking that over. We, um, she identified areas um, that we needed to work on in terms of better defining what they are. For example, what is a per personal learning plan? Is it uh, academic versus student? Um, she encouraged us, and we talked about the importance of actually turning this into an action plan as soon as possible, but we realized that Alan, as the superintendent, really needs to be the one to determine how we go about doing that. So that's, the process will continue, what it will look like, and um, we are meeting again on Monday, May 26th, to keep the discussions going. Thank you, Trish. Um, March, I'm sorry, Monday, March. <laughs> A long time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, student extracurricular committee, Linda Winker, yes. <laughs> in big letters. Uh, student extracurricular committee met on March 6. Uh, most the most of our discussion uh, centered around the turf field, the Hannaford field. Um, it's they've had their first construction meeting with the contractor for the turf field. And Sue and Keith were there to provide the committee with an update as far as where the plan is going from here. Um, it looks like the start of construction is going to be delayed slightly, and they don't uh, um, see that construction will be finished until mid to end of May. So the hope was to actually have some spring sports on the field, and it, it looks like that probably is not going to be happening at this time. Um, there has been a subcontractor hired by the turf construction company that will be coming in and starting some of the site work. They still have some of the logistics of the placement of curbings and fencing and, you know, proposed bleachers and all that. All of that is still in the works at this point in time from what we gathered at our meeting. Um, there was, uh, the turf is going to be slightly different than originally planned. Um, there are going to be some permanent markings on the field that will include football, boys lacrosse, and soccer. And as a part of the contract, there is a maintenance agreement that will supply seasonal lines for both girls lacrosse and field hockey. And that is a part of the contract and will continue for the, I call it temporary lines, and that's not the correct term. I want to be honest about that. Um, but they are line markings that will be put down for those sports and will wear off at, you know, at the end of those seasons. Um, Keith and Sue are working with um, the town on a lot of the plans as far as how things are going to be laid out and how they're gonna, how they're going to look, and they will be our eyes and ears, you know, as this construction process gets going, uh, and reporting back to us on a regular basis. Um, it does look like there's going to be some water access right to the field, which we don't have now. In other words, a water fountain that will be accessible to the team players and all of that. And I'm not sure, last we knew, the town was still working on the DEP permit because there are some issues with water runoff and all that, and the town is, uh, at the last that I knew, um, that still was not taken care of. But they are working on some alternatives to, to meet the requirements of the state to get that cleared up so that they can actually start construction. So we're hoping to see that done, you know, by the end of May, which would be very nice. Um, as well, we reviewed some policies uh, in the committee uh, as far as, as, and made some recommended changes, and we're forwarding those policies on to the policy committee. Um, let me see. Uh, we did also, we're also making some recommendations to delete policies that are repetitive uh, because of information that's contained in other policies that we've all been working on. And let me see, our next Scheduled meeting is for April 3rd at 3 o'clock in the Jordan Conference Room. Thank you, Linda. Yep. Wellness Committee, Rebecca. We had our first meeting on March 1st. And it was, took the opportunity to introduce ourselves to each other and um, come up with a common meeting date, which will be Monday afternoons at 3.15. Um, we agreed to some basic meeting guidelines and norms because we are a committee at the moment of 
Well, now that we have two student representatives, we're up to 18 members. <laughs> so um, we thought it was best to maybe come up with some clear ideas about how the meetings are going to flow so we aren't there for three to four hours at a time. Um, it went really well. We, uh, Paula Harris kindly provided a brief, brief overview of the history of wellness efforts in Cape Elizabeth. We reviewed the school board wellness policy and discussed short term, which by that I mean November of 2007, and longer term goals. The committee agreed that for now the focus would initially be on nutrition and exploring um, the idea of adding psychological emotional component to the wellness policy. And uh, within the November time frame, the committee hopes to inventory existing wellness programs, learn of other school systems efforts, invite speakers, and work to choose a program or recommend a program that best fits the needs and culture of Cape schools. In addition, there is a subgroup of the committee that will work on suggested changes to the wellness policy to include psychological emotional components for a full committee review and discussion to then be passed up to the policy committee. Um, we are very lucky to be having Lisa, Dr. Lisa Letourneau come to speak to us at our next meeting at April 2nd at 3.15. She is one of the founders of the Scarborough Wellness Initiative and it's our hope to be able to um, garner from her strategies and lessons learned so we don't uh, reinvent the wheel all over again here. Thank you. Kevin, do you have anything on paths? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> briefly, our next meeting is this Thursday at noon. If anybody would like to join the committee for lunch, just give me a call. Um, I will be managing a three-ring circus, i.e. the past budget hearings, um, which will not be going as smoothly as they have in the past. And um, if I survive the meeting, I will email everybody on the board um, with what's happening with uh, that particular budget. Thank you, Kevin. Kathy? Yes. May I um, yes. speak about legislative? Yes. Yeah, well, I guess we, we sorry, we left it off. That's okay. I'm the poor cousin of the... Uh, That's okay. Mary saying I'm sorry. <laughs> I said my fault. No, it's <laughs> not. It's fine. I'm pushy enough where I'll just put my name right on there anyway. Um, I just wanted to... Uh, We're not worried that you... <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I just wanted to share with um, the public, because I know that uh, the school board members received the most recent email from the um, Maine School Management Association, but I think it's important to, co to note that wh where we are in the consolidation process discussion up in Augusta. Um, basically, as I'm aware, there are two plans now under serious consideration. One is the Education Committee Plan, which provides for regional planning alliances with membership that represents school boards, municipal officials, and members of the general public. In addition, it provides for both regional collaboration and consolidated units, requires consolidation plans for school units with fewer than 1,200 pupils, and reduces the um, state funding to this local districts by 36.5 million in fiscal year 09 on the state side through non-instructional savings. There was a minority report issued by um, Senator Peter Mills. It's called the Mills Plan, and it requires the State Board of Education to develop consolidation plan that yields an average unit size that exceeds 2,500 students in not more than 80 school units. Um, now, the MSMA did kind of give their opinion as to, um, this was all provided to the Appropriations Committee, and MSMA um, characterizes their um, approach to the plans as not being overly receptive of the Education Committee's majority report, with some members indicating that it was not prescriptive enough, not fast enough, and not likely to produce the projected savings. Um, they, the MSMA was unable to assess the Appropriation Committee's reaction to the Mills Plan. Um, at this point, I would like to just ask the school board, um, would you like to weigh in at this point with the Appropriations Committee as to where, where we would like to see, how we like, would like them to vote? And why don't you think about it and email me, <laughs> given that it's 9.15. That sounds like a plan. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Rebecca, for that and keeping us up to date on those. Um, Technology Committee, Linda, anything? Yep. We're continuing our, our monthly meetings. We had our last meeting on February 28th and um, review three more sections of the revid to revise the plan. And the three sections we went through this time was supporting resources, which is basically, basically talking about the current and proposed personnel needs for the individual school buildings as well as district-wide, and also provided a listing of the current software, pro software and hardware programs that we are using uh, both in the buildings and, again, district-wide. The second piece had to do with professional development and is going to provide an overview of both our current and proposed status on the integration of technology into the district and uh, provides a focus on technology use, uh, focus on how the technology we use will align with and support the learning results and provides a mean of, means of professional learning. And the third section we went through was the innovative delivery strategies. And there was a lot of uh, interesting conversation when we got to this as far as getting some input from the people in the tech department as far as some of the uh, programs that are out on the internet that we can access, web-based programs and different strategies that we may be able to start taking advantage of. We have the technology. It's just learning uh, what is out there, what we can use, tapping into it, and training everybody district-wide how to use it and how it can be effective, you know, with our curriculum and in the classrooms. And uh, we have our next meeting coming up Wednesday, March 21st at 2.30. Thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. Karen, did you? <laughs> yes, yeah. I have a question. I don't know if this has already come up in the Technology Committee, and I might have missed it, but out of curiosity, um, and you don't have to have the answer right now. I was just curious about tech staff um, at Cape Elizabeth versus other schools that are trying to accomplish some of the same things. Um, just curious about the amount of people we have on board, because I know how hard a lot of the tech people work. I don't know if anyone has that information or. Gary has that information. We talked about a part of that, and a part of that will be part of the plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, public comment. I know you are all public too, so I'm just asking. I don't see anybody wanting to make a comment. I know Jeff probably wants to come back up to the podium a few more times. <laughs> <laughs> School board agenda requests. Does anybody have any? No? Okay. Announcement of upcoming meetings. I'll try to go through it quickly. Personnel committee, Thursday, March 15th. 8 o'clock, Jordan Conference Room, School Board Workshop, Tuesday, March 20th, 7 p.m., High School Library. The topic is the budget. Policy Committee, Thursday, March 20th, 12 noon, Jordan Conference Room. Wellness Committee, Monday, March 26th, 3.15 p.m., Fire Station Meeting Room. School Board Workshop, Tuesday, March 27th. Do we have two? Well, I think you have it down there. It says if it's needed for oh. budget. Okay. So, if it's needed, well, we won't we won't put that one in then right now, right? Because that's our normal right. That's our normal time. But um, student extracurricular committee Tuesday, April third, uh, three to four p.m. William Jordan Conference Room School Board Business Meeting Tuesday, April tenth, seven p.m. Council Chambers Calendar Committee Monday, March nineteenth, three p.m. Middle School Conference Room, which is across from the main office. School Board Workshop, Saturday, March 24th, 8.30 a.m. to 12.15 p.m., Council Chambers, Topic Budget. Technology Advisory Committee, Wednesday, March 21st, 2.30 p.m., Con Jordan Conference Room. Strategic Planning Committee, Friday, March 26th, 12 to 2, in the Superintendent's Office. Finance Committee Meeting, Wednesday, March 28th, 8.30 a.m., in the Superintendent's Office. Communications Committee, March, Monday, April 9th, 3 p.m. Pond Cove Media Center, and there's a PATHS meeting this Thursday, 3.15, March 15th at noon with Kevin. One correction, that yes. March 26th is actually a Monday. Oh, okay, on the strategic planning. Right, I'm sorry, yes. I just want to be you. sure I've got wellness right. You had said just a few minutes ago it would be April yeah, 2nd, and I noticed it's March. Yeah. It had, it, uh, that's, 
not Mary's fault, but we had agreed to that original date, and then when we tried to get Dr. Latorno, um, the only time that she could come was April 2nd, so we have subsequently changed that date. So it's April 2nd? It is April 2nd. 315 Fire Station meeting room? If you could check with the uh, Yes. Okay. And, uh, yeah. I have another correction as well. Yes. Not with the date or the time, but the Technology Advisory Committee is planning to meet in the new conference room in the technology office in the basement of the building. Ooh. Ooh. All right. Very nice. <laughs> Are we all invited? <laughs> Coffee and donuts, right? Um, great. Anything and else? All of you should go see their new offices. New digs, okay. To check it out. Um, any other business? I move we adjourn. Thank you. Second? Kevin, any discussion? All in favor? Thank you, 7-0, we're adjourned.